Hi everybody, this is Dr. A. I'm bringing you a couple lessons on some automation basics and we're going to start here uh, well, with some basics, basics in clinical chemistry. Okay, so let's start with a little history. Um, the first automated analyzer was introduced in 1957, not that long ago, more than 70 years ago. It was a continuous flow, single channel, sequential batch analyzer, and it was able to do 40 samples per hour, which was faster than the manual methods back then. Then the second generation was a simultaneous uh, multiple analyzer. It could do 360 to 720 tests per hour. Then uh, the first centrifugal analyzer was introduced in 1970. It was the first alternative to continuous flow. And I will explain the difference between continuous flow and centrifugal analysis here in just a minute. Uh, DuPont then introduced the automatic clinical analyzer in 1970 also, and it was the first random access discrete analyzer. I will also define these terms for you in just a minute if you will just bear with me. Then uh, the Kodak Ektachem was introduced in 1978. It was the first use of microsample volumes, dry reagent slides, and computer technology. And then since 1980, discrete analyzers have uh, incorporated ion selective electrodes, fiber optics, polychromatic analysis, so that's multiple color, multiple wavelength, right? Um, computers with sophisticated software and larger test menus. So it's really done nothing but grow. Um, since 1980. Uh, the recent advances will include uh, point of care benchtop analyzers, uh, immunochemistry analyzers, and modular analyzers, which are an analyzers that have multiple modules contained in them. They're usually large chemistry analyzers. So what has been driving automation? Well, automation allows for higher volume of testing and faster turnaround time. Faster turnaround time means faster decisions, faster treatments for the patients. Uh, and higher volume of testing also means that more can be done uh, in a shorter amount of time. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's and more tests, more results, more information, more decisions, more treatments, more patients to be, you know, that can be seen. They, um, it also has led uh, to fewer, more centralized um, core labs. Um, this is for, especially for reference testing and things. So these are the big send out labs um, like Quest, American is Esoteric, um, and um, LabCorp. So, um, and that's in the U.S. I'm sure there are others um, all across the world. And um, the advantage of those centralized core labs is um, they get a lot of samples come in from a whole region, and so they have they're able to have a higher volume. With a higher volume, they can have a lower te test cost. Um, and so, if um, if it's too expensive to bring a test into a clinical lab that's local, then it's the advantage is to use a reference lab because you can get the test done a lot cheaper, which then saves uh, money and lowers the cost of healthcare. There are also some regulatory standards that require greater accuracy and precision, especially as compared to the manual methods. There's also intense competition among instrument manufacturers that keeps, again, making automation better and faster and more expensive, new technology, etc. cetera. Uh, and then there's been a decreased operating budgets for labs. So um, again, as we try to curtail the cost of healthcare, uh, some of the reimbursements have, have gone down. The reimbursement models have changed from um, a fee-for-service type reimbursement where every test that a physician ordered, uh, it was reimbursed automatically by the um, Medicaid, Medicare, and the insurance companies. They've gone to more of uh, like a flat fee kind of thing where, um, if you will, they get a certain amount of money per diagnosis of the patient that comes in to, you know, manage the case. And therefore, um, the labs and lab tests went from uh, being a revenue generation generator in the fee-for-service model to a cost and uh, it's like the DRG outcomes based type model where um, hospitals get a, a set budget, a set uh, dollar amount per case, 
and they have to manage everything about that case within uh, that budget and if they spend more then the hospitals have to eat the cost um, and so again that has affected the operating budgets in the labs um, and then the ability to walk away from the analyzer I'm really familiar with that having worked in the lab overnight a lot of times you have to uh, man multiple analyzers and so it's good to be able to um, load samples on an analyzer and if everything's good you can just walk away and go work on a different machine uh, while it's running and then you can come back to it and so um, that is been able to allow labs to do more with less staff. So the advantages of automation, it increases the number of tests performed in a lab, uh, it decreases the labor and the cost per test, it decreases the exposure to bloodborne pathogens, it minimizes variation in results among laboratorians, and I would even say among laboratories in certain cases, it eliminates potential errors of manual analyses, and uh, instruments use very small amounts of samples and reagents, so it lowers the cost and also lowers the sample requirements uh, from the patients, so that's good, we need less blood. Um, disadvantage, some people could say, well, isn't all this automation just going to make lab techs irrelevant, and that's not the case. And uh, I know for sure in the US nationwide, there's a shortage of lab techs, so everything that we can do to automate uh, and make the most use of the resources that we have in human resources and in capital, human capital and um, our, our lab techs, the better we are because we are needed, um, but um, we, we are not meeting the market demand uh, as it is for laboratorians. So some automation basics, uh, continuous flow analysis um, in this type of automation, liquids are pumped through a system of continuous tubing nonstop using peristaltic pumps. So this is an illustration of a peristaltic pump at work. So you can see it's pumping samples through. It's always pumping. The samples are introduced in a sequential manner and bubbles separate the samples. You can do many tests on many patients in one run, but then all the tests that the machine does are performed no matter what test is ordered. It doesn't have the capacity to just single out tests. Um, there are problems with carryover and extensive uh, maintenance. So the carryover would be like as, as the specimen is going through the tubing, if there's something from the specimen that sticks to the tubing, then it could contaminate the next sample. Centrifugal analysis, uh, the force of centrifugation transfers and contains liquids. Um, so it adds reagents and samples into a single cuvette and then it uses centrifugal force to, to mix them. So um, sometimes it can go back and forth or it just you know, spins. Um, and one of the ones more uh, recent that we've used in our little lab, it's a smaller version of it, it's the Abbott Piccolo. Uh, and uh, it uses centrifugal analysis. And so it has a little rotor cartridge and you put the sample in the middle and then it actually uses centrifugal force to separate the plasma but also distribute it in the reagent chambers and then the reagent um, mixes with the sample and the reactions happen. Um, it is capable of batch analysis. Um, so in a piccolo, it's usually it's cartridge um, that are panels and once you, you load your sample and load your panel that you're going to run, that's the only thing that is going to run at the at that time. You can't load anything else. It uses uh, a spectral photometer to read the reactions. It can produce uh, results quickly, and, but it only runs one test at a time or one like uh, panel for the one the piccolo one panel at a time. Um, the uh, discrete analysis, so this is what really is the most common, so if you've worked with any kind of clinical chemistry analyzer, chances are you've worked with discrete analysis. Um, so you have the separation of each sample and reagent into a separate container. That container could be um, a cuvette, but it also could be uh, a dry slide, you know, um, type of technology. Uh, it is the most popular type of clinical chemistry analyzer. It can run multiple tests on one sample at a time, or multiple samples one test at a time, or multiple samples multiple tests at a time, uh, and it is uh, capable of random sampling. 
and uh, meaning that you know it, it can sample according to uh, need for the most efficient use of time and uh, therefore you can have in different cuvettes you could have in one cuvette patient A's glucose running and then the cuvette next to it is patient B's calcium running and then the next one is patient you know C's BUN running etc so um, and it, it can sample from whatever it needs to at any time so um, it often is um, modular it has a combination of different testing methods so it has ion selective electrodes has a spectrophotometry module it has amino acid modules it uses chemiluminescent and uh, so it has all of those into one big platform so random access versus batch analyzer so the random access offers options so usually there's a specimen barcode and the barcode is read, and that's what directs the analyzer to the tests that are to be done. So it'll interface with the lab information system, uh, and it will pull what tests need to be done according to the barcode number. Um, the large modular clinical chemistry analyzers are all random access. So just think about it this way in random access. You can load some samples in the analyzer and hit run. And then you can get more samples come into the department and you can load them before that first run is done. You can load more. OK, you can load it all the way to capacity, basically. Uh, so you can keep adding and it's going to keep and you press start again is it will continue doing the analysis that have been started, all of that. And then it's going to scan the new set for the new samples and then start the new, the new analyses. Um, you know, as it has, you know, software that times it all properly so everything can be done efficiently. So again, most of your large chemistry analyzers are going to be discrete random access analyzers. That your batch analyzers perform the same single test on many samples. Uh, they're often benchtop analyzers. Uh, and the idea with a batch analyzer is you would gather up all your samples and your calibrators and controls or whatever you need and you would load all of it in the analyzer and once you start that batch you're not adding anything else to it you have to wait till that entire batch all of the testing get done on the entire batch before you could um, do another batch so you cannot do like one sample at a time with a batch analyzer so a little bit to consider on analyzer selection. So if you're having to shop for an analyzer or decide what your lab needs, so you need to consider not only the cost of the actual instrument, but all the associated um, consumables. So um, that could be things like the cuvettes, um, if it needs pipette tips, uh, wash, um, all the reagents, uh, everything that will be used up in the testing process. And so sometimes, if the analyzer cost is not too high and you're like, oh, this looks reasonable, you have to look, but are they getting you on the consumables in or are the cuvettes kind of expensive? Um, and then you want to calculate the total cost per test for each instrument on the various ones that you're considering. Perform a break-even analysis on the relationship of the fixed cost to variable cost and profits. Um, and so fixed costs are very predictable, variable costs, um, they will vary on the testing load, on, um, they may fluctuate daily depending on how busy the lab is. Um, and I know profit sounds eh, kind of maybe off-putting for healthcare, but uh, one thing you have to know within hospitals and um, other healthcare entities is there are basically departments that cost money and departments that make money and we just try to get it all to even out in the end so we can take care of patients. Um, you also need to factor in the mode of acquisition. Is this an analyzer that will be purchased, leased, or rented? You can do things like reagent rentals. So um, there are different modes and again you just got to analyze all of it and see what works best for uh, the, the entity. If you're in a small rural clinic, maybe they just cannot afford to put the capital down to purchase and it's better for them to do a reagent rental because then that allows them to bring up-to-date technology in. It's a little bit more expensive per test, uh, but they, they're not stuck with having to purchase a big analyzer and then trying to figure out what to do with it then when it becomes out of date. So you want to consider the, um, the analytic capabilities of the instrument. Can the instrument expand its testing menu is another good question to ask. So will the analyzer meet the testing demand of 
the physicians that are in interfacing and interacting with the lab and can the lab add new tests as they come can uh, they expand maybe there's some other tests that they have considered bringing into uh, the lab that uh, the physician would be interested in would it be worth it is that part of the menu all of that, those questions uh, can be asked and then you definitely want to observe the instrument in operation on a trial basis so you can see if you really like it and um, if it's, you know, is it user friendly? Does it have all kinds of problems? Does it take um, a long time to run stuff or to set it up or et cetera? It's good to have a good hands on experience there. Uh, and so we're going to finish up with future trends. Um, we're going to see more integration in miniaturization of operating systems more sophisticated portable analyzers, um, new tests for expanded menus. We're always looking for the next new biomarker of disease to expand testing capacities and diagnosis for patients. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of that is using artificial intelligence and um, you know looking at all the, these diverse markers that are available uh, in research and what really has clinical application, et cetera. Um, we're going to see also uh, more spectral mapping, multiple wavelength monitoring, uh, high resolution photometers and the analyzers, and then um, more extensive use of mass spectrometry and capillary electrophoresis, and then also system and workflow integration with robotics and data management. Okay, so I'm going to wrap this up here and we're going to go to the next video which is, go is this going to be um, the steps in automated analysis in clinical chemistry. All right, see you there.